All right, so I think we'll get started. I'm your host, Franny French, and I would like to welcome you all to Liquid Margins today, to Northern Annotation, Social Learning in Canadian Higher Education. And then today's wonderful guests, um, unfortunately, one of our wonderful guests was not able to make it, and um, that's Lillian Hogan Dorn. She's the acting manager of digital access and OER at eCampus Ontario. Um, we love eCampus Ontario. We're sorry she wasn't able to be here today. We'll probably, most likely, definitely, I guess, have somebody from eCampus Ontario on the show in the future. Um, and we, but we do have here today Olga Andrievsky. She's associate professor of history at Trent University. And Fargal O'Hagan, he's the Associate Professor of Psychology at Trent University as well. And our moderator today is Nate Angel, and he's the Director of Marketing at Hypothesis. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Nate. And Nate, if you'd like to um, reintroduce our guests and ask them if they have um, anything they'd like to kick it off with. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for getting us going, uh, Franny. Uh, and it's really, I'm really excited to be here. And, and just to, as a caveat, like if you're not from Canada, it's okay. We have a lot of Canadians here. Our guests are Canadian. Um, and, uh, but if you're uh, not from Canada, that's fine. Um, in the audience, um, we will be talking about social annotation more broadly. And so I'm sure it will apply across the border as well. Um, if you happen to be in the United States or in some other country, that would be great. So as Franny said, I'm Nate uh, and I joined here with my um, colleagues from Hypothesis, Franny. And then we've also got um, Aaron Baker is, um, Barker, sorry, <laughs> Aaron Barker, excuse me, Aaron, uh, is uh, here and able to answer um, technical questions that might come up. So if you have those, um, feel free to put them in the chat because these these shows we tend to talk about the pedagogy and sort of the interesting human angles of social annotation more than the the technical nitty gritty. And so, if you have kind of more specific questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and someone like Aaron um, can answer. We also have a few other uh, hypothesis folks here, um, like uh, I saw that Lori's here, who uh, is actually in Canada herself, and. Uh, even though she works for Hypothesis because we're a completely distributed organization. Um, Gina is also here. So there's a whole bunch of people ready to answer your questions in the chat um, if you want to, if you have anything that we're not addressing uh, in the conversation itself. But then without further ado, I'd like to um, kind of switch over to um, talk with our guests for a little while. Um, and we'll have some time for questions and answers with the audience later. But um, to start off, I was wondering, Olga, if you might say a couple of words about um, kind of your practice, like what it is that you do um, as an educator. And then I'd love to know how you came to learn about social annotation and hypothesis um, and how you first brought it into your work. Yeah, I'm a, a, a historian at Trent University. And uh, it's for those of you there, I, I can see from the chat, there are a whole bunch of people there from 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 Trent. So I don't and from and from southern Ontario who don't need an explanation of what Trent University is. But for those of you who don't know, it's a small liberal arts college or university um, with a with a history of emphasis on small group teaching, especially in the, the humanities. And um, so we, um, we, our department in general and the English department, um, we've been teaching for decades using the whole seminar system, um, which is fantastic. So there was always an emphasis right from the start um, on, on, student inter, on student interaction and participation and, and all of that. Um, I stumbled into hypothesis during one of the workshops that was being offered um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were all trying to figure out how we were going to teach in this in this new world of remote remote and online teaching, and in particular, it was a course um, being offered by Brent Bellamy from the English department, who was using who who was part of the first pilot program and was using it in in uh, his course. And there was no discussion or emphasis on hypothesis, but the minute I saw it, I was really, really, really interested. 
because um, one of the things uh, I, that I try to do in, in, in my teaching in general is to uh, shift the emphasis to um, social, social learning. I teach um, Soviet history. I teach um, uh, and, and uh, uh, in particular a course on, on um, the uh, history of the Soviet Union. Um, and then a fourth year course I'm teaching this year on uh, the Second World War and the Soviet Union. And that's a seminar course, so there are no lectures. And um, that's where I'm using hypothesis because it's an intensive reading and discussion course. And um, I've been, it's a year long course. So I've had the luxury of being able to use the program for an entire year. Um, and I've made some small accommodations, uh, but I, I told my students right away that this is an experiment and I've been watching it and sort of making a few adjustments as, as I've said um, uh, along the way. And uh, I haven't used it in my third year course. It's a semester long course, um, but the fourth year course really lent itself well to, uh, to, to, to this. And um, it's hard for me to say on the basis of one year how successful it is. I will say my students are fantastic. <laughs> and I don't know if they were, they were gonna be fantastic no matter what, or the degree to which you know, hypothesis has kind of drawn them in uh, even further into, uh, into, the, into the course. And I'll, I'll let Fergal speak. Uh, I don't wanna monopolize all the time, but I'll, I will say the thing that surprised me is um, the way, and this was unanticipated, the way in which it keeps students engaged with each other outside of that weekly slot when we're, we're together. So um, it's an, it's, I have two groups, they're really nice students, um, but I get the sense that you know, it's, it's really helped them uh, engage uh, as, a, as a community. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so the, the, the experience I've had so far, small, not a big sample, I don't want to draw too many conclusions from it, but um, I see a lot of positives that would make me want to continue using the program. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And that, that idea of building community around the reading, um, I think is really, that's something that we are sort of talk about a lot and are really interested in understanding how that happens in different contexts. So i um, love to talk about that more during the show. But yeah, let's, let me ask sort of the same question to Fergal, um, in a sense, first, how did you come to learn about social annotation and start using it? But also, if you wanted to expand on anything that Olga had uh, introduced us to about Trent and kind of what your classes are like, uh, especially during these pandemic times, that would be interesting to hear as well. Yeah, well, um, I thought likewise, uh, I stumbled upon it by, by chance, kind of. Uh, I came on board as the acting director of Trent Online um, last summer. And it was, I, I've been, you know, uh, the idea of social learning is really interesting because my team has been teaching me so much about online learning. And uh, like Olga, I went through the professional development training last summer, uh, picked up a lot from that. Uh, but my introduction to hypothesis was actually when we were, um, Maureen Glenn, who's our senior e-learning designer, uh, has been organizing our pilot. And I was introduced to it at a meeting that the, where we were meeting with some of the faculty who were using it and um, they started talking about it and I thought this is really neat I know where I could use this and so I incorporated it into my fourth year seminar course which is a team-based uh, structure uh, like Olga our courses our courses in psych um, sort of lower years tend to be larger uh, than, than the humanities, but by fourth year where, uh, you know, our, our seminar courses are, you know, 20 to 25 sort of thing. Uh, so uh, a way, and mine is structured on a team, uh, has a team structure to it. So students work in teams of five and the task that they have uh, to, go, to go about is basically doing like sort of layered group work that 
eventually builds, um, the course is called Models of Self-Control. So it's about building um, explanatory models for why people behave as they do and applying those models to the development of programs. And so the students start reading papers and extracting um, behavioral outcomes, but more, you know, determinants of behavior. So the things that sort of influence our behavior in terms of our internal experiences and uh, things in the environment. And I thought hypothesis would be a perfect tool for them to start to get access to those, those uh, things through their readings and to build, start to build conversations. And um, so that's, that's how I came to it. And that's, you know, sort of where I saw it fitting into my course. And uh, it's been, I, I, I would say, like, I've taught that course in a different format um, a number of times previously. And hypothesis has been uh, a not really nice feature that I will definitely continue with when we go back to face-to-face -to -face teaching with uh, with that course. Like it's a it's a it's a must have now. I think for me, yeah. Wow, that's that's a strong strong testimonial. Um, and I'm curious about I, just to follow up a little bit on what you said there about this idea of continuing um, social annotation in a face-to-face -face environment because I think a lot of people like y'all did. Uh, sort of end up uh, learning about and starting to use hypothesis during the pandemic when things moved to remote. And yet, can you say more about how you would how you would think about using it in a, when teaching is fully face to face? Or Olga? Olga? Yeah, or right. I mean, I, I want to hear from Olga too, but I thought just because you had just said sure. that for you might have a follow up. Either way. <laughs> so the course. Uh, yeah, so the, the, I've, I've, I've also used, I'm using Microsoft Teams to organize the teamwork, which is, an, which is another thing I'm going to continue with or something like that. Um, and I had, prior to Hypothesis, I had been using discussion boards, which I've found to be, like, you know, there are ways of using them, I guess, that are, they're helpful, but it was, you know, it was, in previous iterations of the course, it was, it was kind of getting to, you know, like post once, reply twice kind of thing and getting very, I don't know, like just wrote and, and uninteresting for students. Um, and so with hypothesis, what I find I can do is not turn the, the students loose into the course, but it's like, okay, so listen, gang, this is what you need to be looking for in these papers because this is what you're going to need for your models. Go find it, all right? Take uh, a couple of days on your own reading through them and then flip it to, um, you know, group public view and then start talking about it uh, between yourselves, right? As to what you can use. And um, I found that there, like the depth of reading in, in the papers has generally been better, much better, um, where, you know, they, I mean, they have that direction as to where they need to be going with it, but they'll be, you know, in their initial reads, you can see where they're annotating. Oh, okay. So this is something we need to look at determinant. They'll def be defining things, outcome expectancy. What does that mean? Right. And, uh, and then, I mean, as they get more familiar and sophisticated with it, the, their sophistic the sophistication of their, their annotations uh, increases as well. And so uh, it's just a better way. It, it is just a better way of doing it versus um, the previous method I was using in the course. So we'll go. Yeah, and I and and Olga, I'll give you a chance here to, to go right in that same direction. But um, this idea of how the discussion forum untethered to the text can be a sort of like less useful way to have that kind of discussion. But when you anchor the discussion inside the text, it allows for new kinds of possibilities. So Olga, do you also think of using uh, social annotation after remote teaching as a past? 
Oh yeah, no, it's uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, my goal in the course is to get students to un to read text as interpretation, and um, it, it's it's what I did before the pandemic. It's what I'll do after the pandemic. And actually, having them go through the text together, looking for an argument, uh, looking for an interpretation, is really really important. And and the best students will always, you know, the quick there are students who will get that immediately, but there are other students for whom it takes a, a, a really long time. And this is a way of speeding speeding up the process because they. See the other students uh, engaging in that kind of, of discussion. I mean, the other thing I'd say um, is that uh, in my fourth year course on the Soviet Union and the Second World War, I have a mix of students who've had some Soviet history before and students who have had no Soviet history before and some students who are real military buffs so they know all sorts of things that that I don't even know. And what what's fabulous is that the students who've had haven't had Soviet history can say what's that and then without having me to come in as the authority, uh, another student who's had some, has some familiarity can jump in and say, well, that's what it is. Or somebody could just even look it up from Wikipedia and put in a, a, a definition. And um, so, so that's a whole different dimension of, of what they get to do that would be lost uh, in, a, in, a, in the face-to-face -face of a classroom. So by the time they, we get to discuss this as a whole group together in a seminar, um, they've already done quite a bit of learning. Yeah, and that's a pattern that we've heard before where it's um, when you do come together for synchronous discussion, whether that's on Zoom or, or maybe live face to face um, when we can do that, uh, you know, having the socially annotated reading power and inform that then later group discussion can can really change the game quite a bit. You know, I, I see folks in the chat getting frustrated as they often do in these shows because, you know, we're talking about kind of highfalutin ideas here um, and they, they're they still like, but wait, how does it work? Um, and so I can understand that. Um, and we have other ways for them to learn how, you know, the nitty gritty of how it works. But I'm wondering, um, Olga, you had talked before about maybe be, being more specific about how you actually orchestrate uh, the use of it in your course. And you've talked, you mentioned a couple of things already about how you use it, but like, so um, exactly what kinds of readings are you assigning? Are they, are they PDFs or web articles or, um, and then what is, are there certain assignments? How do you um, ask the students to get involved in the annotation specifically? Yeah, I, I saw that somebody asked a, a question, uh, Becky Rudd asked if, if the, um, if, if hypothesis is used for all course readings, I made a decision uh, in before the course started that I would use it every single week because I didn't want them sort of thinking, oh, is this the week we have to do it? Oh, great, we don't have to do it. You know, it, it, I, I wanted them to get into a rhythm and a routine. Every once in a while, I will, um, uh, I will just say, you don't have to annotate this one, but annotate this one and give them a little bit of a, of a break that way. But it's been pretty pretty much routine. I use PDFs. Um, I, I uh, put them on Google Drive and then um, use the web tool link uh, so that they can't do the course readings without going to Hypothesis. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward for, for, for them in, in, in that regard. I don't know. Um, Sorry, did I miss ahead. a question? No, I think I think that that was good. And um, so similar to Fergal, so um, what kinds of readings? How do you how do you get them in front of students? And you you already did mention a little bit about how you you know make the assignment. But compared to say a discussion forum assignment like you were talking about, how is it that you get students to like see the annotation as an active part of the course? Well, I assign a participation grade. <laughs> So it's really to, well, the, the, and this is this is um, kind of standard for uh, for seminar courses in our university. Twenty five percent of their final grade is seminar discussion and participation. And um, one of the attractions for me initially of hypothesis was this was yet another way to allow students who maybe don't like to speak up in a discussion um, in a room full of people 
who might feel a lot more comfortable just uh, being able to, you know, engage in a, in a different way um, and over a period of time too, because they can walk away from it and come back. We use Blackboard at Trent. So um, that's how, that's the, the gateway to uh, posting all of this stuff. Yeah. And Fergal, do you want to go down that same road? I saw you unmute for a second there. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I can share what it looks like, Nate. If, uh, that would know. be great. Yeah. If you want to try sharing your screen and give uh, people a little tour, that would be great. Then, then they'll have a little bit of visual cues about how it works. Um, so I've got a couple of, uh, I'm just going to share this. So that's our campus. Ah, looks icy. It, th this is a, this is last week. So it's okay. getting better. Okay. Uh, that's and spring in Canada. That is, yeah. Uh, so the team's site um, is set up so that the, the way the course is structured, uh, there are groups assigned to different um, behavioral intervention targets. So this year, uh, there's a group assigned to reducing single-use plastics, um, one assigned to uh, stress reduction among um, uh, clients at a community health center uh, related to COVID. And there's, so there's five of these groups, and they're set up on uh, teams to be able to work back and forth. Um, so a lot of their work starts there, and then uh where are we here i where is my you're nimbly moving around though i'm impressed by your screen sharing Ooh, already not. um i just wanted to find my screen share for my um that's not it that's my email <laughs> looks like you got some email to answer I do. It's it's a continual battle. Um, I'm just trying to find my browser. Yeah, that's right. While you while you're looking for that, I'll take the pressure off too. And um, so, um, one thing that I think both of you might address is if how you your this is coming from the audience who Francesco uh, asked this question about if you actually seed readings with your own annotations or maybe you participate in the discussion after the students have gotten going. Uh, so I do, I do see the readings and, um, and their, their annotations. And so what I've been doing is like Olga. So I post the, the readings go into a Google drive and then a link is set up to uh, our, our learning management system site on Blackboard. The students access the readings through Blackboard. Um, so when I click on them, you know, it's a there or when they click on them, it's a direct link to the reading, and they get into their annotation. And then I'm able to follow in behind them and comment on the papers. Um, I see it there now. Comment on the papers. And um, so what I typically do, if you can see that, is. Um, I'll make a page note on the paper. Uh, so this is for our single use plastics group. Uh, and here the, the, the researchers were looking at, you know, um, uh, figuring out determinants of behavior for, for plastic um, and use. And uh, my comment here is, you know, this looks like a nice, nice three step, step study and looking at, an e at ecological, ecological product marketing. Um, and then, you know, I sort of, I make orienting comments um, for them. And then as you can see, and I'm not gonna uh, reveal here cause it's, it's the, my students. Uh, you can see there's 25 annotations in this paper. Um, our, the annotations are ranging from uh, seven up to like nine, there were 95 in one paper. And they'll be of sort of a variety of levels of engagement uh, with the students. Some of the, some of them will be going in and 
defining a term. Uh, some of them will be, you know, identifying a particular intervention method uh, as something that they might consider for their intervention program. And then you start to see the conversation build on that, where the other members will go in and they'll add thoughts. Um, and uh, as, I, as I said, like one thing that I'm noticing over the course of the term is the depth of annotations, not in, not, not in all groups, I wouldn't say that, um, but the depth of thought that go, that's going into the annotations is, is increasing. Um, and then like with, with uh, the annotations, I uh, assign 10, there's a 10%, 10% of the grade is, is for the annotations, which is, you know, there's, there are other things that, that go into the, the grade. But the, in terms of you know, the direct participation, I look at the social annotation as a proxy for that. Um, but it's not, when I talk to the students about their annotations, it's not like, oh, how many, did I do enough? Or how many do, you, well, it started, they started, of course, they, they always, how many do you want, right? Um, and then, of course, I give them some obscure answer that doesn't really answer that, but sort of nudges them along to, to find their way. And then, um, uh, but now it's like the, they need, they want the annotations. They, they find the annotations so helpful because the next step in the process is writing article summaries for an annotated bibliography. And they, you know, they're telling me that, oh, well, I just go to my annotations. And I just build my article summary based on that, and so that's how it looks in the in in the course. And on you know I've just got it set up so that uh, there's links in Blackboard um, that take you take uh, them to their papers. Papers are in in these folders. Um, folders have the links. And then, uh, and then that takes the links take take uh, take them in, yeah. So that's, that makes that makes total sense. Um, and I, thank you. You you addressed a couple of things that folks in the chat were asking about about grading and so forth. And I I'm interested in this idea of keeping the number of required annotations sort of ambiguous. I've heard uh, Gardner Campbell, if you know him, a professor of English, Olga might know him, and down at um, in Virginia, uh, has long made the case that being less specific about what you want students to, to, to give back um, can kind of force them to find their own way, like you were saying, uh, Fergal. Um, and I, just as a clarification note for folks, you saw Fergal show off a page note that he had made. So the difference between annotations and page notes is that the page note is sort of like a note on the document as a whole, whereas the annotations are anchored in specific highlights you know, in the text itself. And so, uh, you know, Fergal's obviously using the page notes there as this sort of general introductory annotation on the document as a whole, that makes sense. And so Olga, back, back to you. Um, do you also have a practice where you um, precede the, um, the readings with your own annotations um, to kind of spark the students off? No, I don't. Um, what I what I do is I've I've told them all along um, that um, there's a way to read history. So um, what's crucial is identifying the main argument, um, uh, talking about or identifying sources and evidence, talking about approach and all of that. I, I want them to sort of train themselves to think of certain questions whenever they read. So I don't go in, I, I actually don't participate in, in, uh, in, in their discussions on hypothesis. One of the things, I mean, this is something um, for me to think about for the future. Um, if a class meets at four, four o'clock, they're often working on hypothesis at three o'clock. So uh, in, in the future, what I would do is um, have a cutoff period, um, say two o'clock or something, so that I could actually go and look at the comments before before the class. But I have two groups, so um, they, it, the uh, hypothesis groups can't be too large. Um, and because uh, then otherwise, otherwise students uh, find that they have nothing to say, especially if they're late to to the whole thing. Um, and but I do make them 
both groups available and I keep them up because one of the things we keep doing is going back and talking about readings we've done earlier in the year and making comparisons and, and all of that. And the notes are there for them all year long to, um, to look at. And I think that's really useful for them as a kind of memory prompt. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so you're actually finding that students are coming back to the same reading and maybe annotating for a second round. Sounds like. um, I don't think they're annotating uh, the second time around, but they're going back and looking at it. And I know that the students in, in one group are, are really curious about the students in the other group. So they are reading each other's comments. So there's learning going on in, in, in that way. Uh, I mean, the other thing is that, you know, beyond the questions that I pose for them that they should be asking every time, students are also commenting on things they find really interesting. And um, for me, that's been a wonderful experience because um, they will sometimes take the whole discussion in a direction in which I hadn't anticipated. And we end up talking about something that's important, something that they see um, that maybe I didn't see uh, in the same way. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of learning going on, a lot of social learning going on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, that's that's awesome to hear. And Fergal, I think I interrupted you. You unmuted there. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say I I, I do go in and um, I ha I do have a presence in their annotations. So if I'm working through the annotations, and more so, I'd say at the at the start of the term or earlier in the term. Um, but you know, I will comment on. And I, I don't really comment. I ask questions of them um, to, to, to orient them um, towards certain things that I think, you know, maybe they're not picking up on um, or things that they need to follow up with. Uh, in this course, each of the groups are assigned a professional advisor who works in uh, the field. And so I'll suggest to them that they follow up with their professional advisor to see how relevant this is to the context uh, that they're, they're developing their programs in. Um, yeah. yeah. And both of you are hitting on something that I think is really um, crucial. I mean, obviously you're, you're talking about relatively advanced courses here. These are, these don't sound like introductory courses, right? And they're relatively small. I'm guessing how, Fergal, how big, how big is your class in terms of students? So I have 23. Okay. So that's so, a pretty small site course, that trend. Yeah. Yeah. And Olga, how large is your class? I have 25 students, but I've broken them up into two seminar groups. Okay. Right. So kind of split them in half. Right. So this, but um, one of the things I wanted to draw out was um, I see in both of your practices here that um, part of what the reading and the annotated reading is doing is helping set up students for writing. And I think that's, there's a really interesting connection, right, between how we read and how we can empower that so that it informs our writing. And I'm wondering if that resonates with you, as if you've seen a change or in the practices around uh, writing. I mean, Fergal, you already mentioned how they're, they're using their annotations in their summaries. Yeah, and what, like, sorry, I'll jump in, Olga, because uh, I tell them right at the start, there is no wasted work in this course. If you want to write, if you want to develop a solid program and, and, and document it, this is the process through which you would go. And so their annotations build their article summaries, their article summaries build their annotated bibliographies, which build their visualized models um, and all of the, the work products that they need to go into a great final uh, paper. And, and so the, you know, so the social annotation really outs the cognitive and social process that goes on um, in, in, in developing their, you know, writing as thinking over time. Um, it, it, it just, it makes it explicit for them. I'm not sure how many of them kind of cop onto that, but uh, I, I, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they, they do, but um, they do recognize that the, the value of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, in this course and in, in my fourth year course, they write historiographical essays. So they are always uh, in every essay, they're comparing interpretations. 
So the more they're discussing interpretation as d d uh, interpretation in, in hypothesis, um, the more they can, you know, uh, conceptualize writing an essay that compares in, in interpretations. So, um, yeah, again, I, it would be curious for me to see over a couple of years um, whether there's a noticeable where the uh, there's a noticeable sort of uh, advance in their in their in their writing and 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 thinking. Um, I I've been telling myself I just have a really exceptional group this year. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it, it might be the, the special class, right? Who knows yeah. what the special ingredients are? Or maybe the pandemic has made everyone a better student. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be hard to believe in these circumstances. You know, another thing that I'm really noticing, we've been sort of answering a lot of the questions that have come up in the chat along the way. Um, so if there are other questions, folks, please feel free to put them in the chat if you feel like we haven't addressed them yet. But the other thing I'm really noticing in both your work, especially in yours, Virgil, but also in Olga's, Olga's is that you're having the students read I'll call it real works, right? You're not having them read some textbook that summarizes something. These are real journal articles and real, you know, um, you know, primary and secondary sources um, that would they would they would use in their scholarly or professional lives moving forward. And so, in a way, they're practicing the kinds of skills that they would need to advance either academically or professionally to go to that next level. Um, and I'm kind of um, I'm inspired to see how uh, you're, you know, maybe this practice of annotation can lead us away from having folks spend a lot of time with, I don't want to say dumbed down texts, but texts that that don't come from the real world and touch on their real, you know, professional and, and scholarly futures, if you will. And so I'm wondering, Olga, if you found that um, in your work, it does seem like you have folks focused on what I'm calling these real texts. Oh yeah, and and by the end of the year, um, one of our goals is to have have them understand what the state of research is. That is, they've read the major works, um, and and they've and what's really fun is they get to read historians who violently disagree with each other, and um, and it really prepares them well for 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 graduate school. It's a it's a good sort of bridging um, class and and. So, so yeah, that's, that's the way I've always taught it. And, and this just kind of adds another, another dimension. Yeah. And Fergal, yours, I mean, it almost seems like your class is like specifically preparing them for professional activity, right? Yeah. So the way I've set it up in contrast to, to prior offerings, which were more, mm, I say sort of more theoretically oriented. Uh, this was, you know, putting theory into action, like purposing it. And so uh, I, I set the course up as uh, a consultancy and the students are consultants in training. And they, they start with scenarios um, relating to behavior change. You know, as I mentioned, a couple of them there, reducing single use plastics. So that group is connected to their professional advisor is the executive director of Peterborough Greenup, which is the community organization that is associated with everything environmental in town. And so they meet with their community advisor. Um, they, their task then is to go back into the literature, look to see what's known about the um, uh, behavior in question and its determinants and then bring that into a, uh, a model, first of all, that identifies, you know, why this problem is happening. And then secondly, a model of change, which identifies what targets there, what, what things we might target uh, to change that behavior. And then in the final phase, um, sorry, I think my notifications are going off here. It's final phase, um, then they um, uh, write up a program based on that. And it's, uh, it's applied in that way, but this would be like, I would like to see if I had a student coming in, a graduate student to supervise who was coming in with this kind of a background, they, they would have a foot up. Uh, so I think both, you know, practice, professional practice, as well as, as advanced studies, um, this kind of having this kind of background would be, would be beneficial for them. And, um, 
and you know having used the social annotation through the process uh, lets them see what good process is. Um, that makes total sense. I'm really I'm impressed by how it seems to be working out for you. And I'll just mention here, and I'll ask Brandon to put a link in the chat um, to kind of get at this idea that Olga brought up of, it would be interesting to see how this affects student writing over time. Um, there's a really um, vibrant research project going on that just got kicked off this year at Indiana University. It's in kind of introductory composition in English classes, but it's specifically investigating this question of the degree to which social annotation can have an effect on kind of reading and writing practices over time. Um, it's a multi-year a multi study actually, so that um, we can put a link in to their, uh, into the chat um, for folks. So there'll be new data coming out about that soon. Um, so I know uh, I know Fergal at least has something that he needs to get to coming up. There was um, one uh, last question that I saw come through in the chat that I thought we might address just as a sort of uh, farewell. So um, so if you want to add on anything else that you want to say um, as we're leaving too, um, as you answer this question that I'll pose to you, that would be great. Um, and then we can close it up so everyone can get on to their next meeting. Um, so. Uh, uh, the annotations themselves can kind of serve as scholarly objects, right? Um, and we talk about students using them in their writing. And uh, Francisco has asked if um, you have or have seen the students actually refer back to and link to annotations they've made in their writing, uh, you know, in their writing, other writing in the course. Like, do they serve, do the annotations themselves serve as sort of primary scholarly objects for them in their further writing? You want to uh, you want to try that one, Olga? Or <laughs> yeah, um, I haven't. Um, uh, I, I, students do talk about each other's comments in discussions, so in that respect, it does enter into into the the seminar itself. Uh, I'm trying to imagine how I might do that. Um, it's uh, it's still a new world for me, so I'm just feeling it out. I, I see it in, so in their article summaries, um, the, you know, the first bit of it is, is a summary of the research. And uh, then the, the wrap up is a critical evaluation of the study. And I see, I see the annotations coming through in, in that part of their article summaries, where you can see how, you know, Things that they've talked about in annotating the papers then um, are expressed in the in the article summary. Great. Well, this has been such a great conversation. Um, so much, so uh, so much to unpack uh, from everything that you've shared. Um, and this this has been recorded, and we'll be sharing it out. It'll probably be up on the site um, by Monday. Uh, so if anyone wants to to review it, we'll we'll be sharing that out. And if you've uh, registered, you'll get a notification that it's up. Um, I really want to thank Fergal and Olga for being here today. Um, uh, really appreciate um, your spending the time with us to share your practice. This is super interesting uh, for me, and I'm sure it was for the audience too. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great to have you here, and thank you, Fergal. Thanks, Nate and Franny. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd just like to say thank you to both of you. So again, thank you for coming to Liquid Margins today, and we will see you next time.